So this morning, Darla pulls up this magazine. And she, she says, I want to paint like that. How do I paint like that? I want to know how to paint like that. Yeah, it's beautiful. Extreme realism. Although, extreme kind of makes it sound exciting. I don't think it's a word that Leonardo da Vinci used when he described his work. But extreme realism is where everything is in focus, where everything is explained to you, where everything is done as if we are looking at it. This is the way that the old masters used to paint. When they would set up a still life, they would set the still life up. And some of you that have gone to the museums, you would see some of these beautiful still lifes and you look at them and they have these beautiful fresh flowers. And then you have other flowers that are a little wilted and other flowers that are dead and bugs and spiders and all kinds of things on them. And you wonder how in the world do they get all those ideas? Well, when you set up a still life, especially in the past where they had open sewers and, you know, bad hygiene, you had a lot of bugs and stuff flying around. And if you set up a still life, you know, it probably got rancid after a while, especially if you were one of these tight painters. And as you dedicate yourself to a flower that's fresh, two weeks later you would have a, a a flower that wasn't so fresh. The next one would be half dead. There are paintings in this book that show watermelon that look like they're just about ready to disintegrate. And I told Darla, I said, the reason for that is they sat in front of their live subjects. And three, four, five weeks later, their subject was feeling the effects of being exposed. You know? And so consequently, you know, that's, that's, they didn't have photography. So they worked from the live, the live model. When artists started painting realism, when Leonardo da Vinci started painting the Mona Lisa, their goal was to start turning paintings into something that was real. They didn't quite understand how to put together interesting compositions. They hadn't gotten to that, that part yet. They were more fascinated with taking a pile of paint and making something that looked three-dimensional. And so, Darla asked, well, how do I paint like that? <coughs> well, you have to recreate how they thought. And they were just amused that they could turn paint and make it look like a grape. And they would look then at another grape and they would do the next grape and then they would do another one. But they sat in front of their, uh, their, their subject and they asked themselves, what makes it look like that? What makes it look like that? And then they proceeded with complete conviction. The level of commitment, which we talked about last week, the level of commitment was that they were not going to stop working on it till it looked just like that. And so they sat and looked back and forth. Leonardo da Vinci said to himself while he was painting, I want to make her flesh look like there's blood pulsing underneath the skin. At the period of time, paintings were more like cartoons. They didn't really care about painting something that looked real. They pretty much put an outline in and then filled it in with flesh color. Very similar to how beginning painters do, because they'll paint a thing looking like a Barbie, because they think flesh color is this color. And they'll paint the whole thing like that, and they'll be afraid to put lights and shadows in. But when they realized that you could put lights and shadows to recreate form, Artists like Leonardo da Vinci were, were stubborn at that point. And they would think, how do I make her look like she's going to speak? Because at that point, everybody sat there like this. Okay? How do I catch the glimmer? The little, you know. And, you know, the, the, the commission for the Mona Lisa was actually, I think, a, a, an ancient shipman, and he wanted his wife or a merchant. And he wanted a painting of his wife. And so that was the original jumping off place. But Leonardo da Vinci painted 30 years on that painting. Whoa. The person who commissioned it never got it. 
because Leonardo da Vinci was after something that had never been done before, and that it was to create a human-like moment, not just a portrait of somebody, but, and then when they talk about that, that fumatsu, the thing that you can't express, that moment where she almost looks like she's going to speak to you, that's what makes that so incredible, especially at that period of time. It's the fleeting moment that he was trying to capture. A lot of people say it was a self-portrait of him. You know, that it was a self-portrait. And who else could it be? Who could you have come over 30 years and not, not you know, to sit there for you? As he moved around, all he had was himself to look at. So yes, when you put his portrait right next to it, it looks like him, okay? Because that's what he ended up using after he started her. She probably was a beautiful young thing that had lots of money and beautiful. But, but as he needed to get this little smile that everybody talks about, that little moment where she looks like she's exhaling, all he had was himself in a mirror that he could like duplicate that and manipulate the eyes and the face. That's why the painting is so extraordinary. And he spent 30 years carting that painting around. <laughs> Never sold it. But his level of commitment was that he wasn't going to let go until it was done. You want to paint like this. Your level of commitment has to be like that. <laughs> you don't have to do it like that. But if you're sitting in front of something and it's working as a thing, if you want to go into extreme realism, you just have to ask yourself, how do I paint like that? How would I actually duplicate what I see? Now the Impressionists said, we don't see that way. We don't see things like that. We see things in a fleeting moment. We glance at things and our brain fills in the, the, the information. We have a focal point. We can't look at something without having an opinion about it. So when I look across this room, every one of you that are half asleep, I immediately have an opinion that I'm boring. Okay? But some of you just didn't get any sleep last night. That's, you know, but, you know, that's just how we react. Something's wrong and I'm not good enough. That's usually how we, we go. But you, can't, you cannot have the brain shut off. It's always having an opinion. If you don't believe me, that thing about not having an opinion, it's just a new opinion that your brain had about not having an opinion. That moment, of, well, that's not true. That's an opinion. Okay, so our brain, whatever we focus on. The Impressionist said if we just paint that impression, we would recreate the effect of of life. But everything else needs to go away. So extreme realism doesn't make sense to our brain. So when we see this, we feel like it's stiff. Because it's not naturally how we see things. We see things, we see either the highlight, the shadow, and the area that we see, the depth of field is so small, we wouldn't see all these edges. Nor would we want to. Because then what happens is that the drawing becomes so much more important that it's no longer about the human experience with the object, it becomes recreating the object. And let's face it, this world is filled with stuff. And we don't need to paint any more stuff. So I think this is good practice, but like the golden mean, it should be used just as a practice. It's a tool. Art has moved on from this point, and we want to recreate the human experience looking at things, not recreate things as they are, because the thrift shops are filled with those things. Okay?